Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee. And joining me are my co-host, Quintus, Managing Editor of Global Markets, Lawrence Lewton, as well as Managing Director of International Content, Emily Parker. Good morning, Emily and Lawrence. Good morning. Good morning. How Some are you? Some news happened over the weekend. We'll talk a bit about that in a moment. All right, checking in on Bitcoin right now. The Quintus Bitcoin Price XVX Index currently trading at $58,977. Bitcoin is tra- trading pretty uh, steady up about two-tenths of a percent over the past 24 hours. And the Coindesk Ether Price ETX Index is at $4,288. ETH is slightly down about eight-tenths of a percent. And the Coindesk DFX, Coindesk's DeFi Index, right now at 562 points. DeFi is slightly advancing about 1.3%. All right, the most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as the leader in crypto news events and data. So some big news over the weekend. El Salvador is doubling down on Bitcoin, creating a Bitcoin city. Have a listen to El Salvador President Naib Bukele. So actually, what I was going to present to you is the building of, not build the beat, yeah. Bitcoin City. All right, that's from the Latin American Bitcoin and Blockchain Conference, uh, the final big announcement of the week-long conference in El Salvador. Uh, Now, El Salvador plans on issuing $1 billion worth of Bitcoin bonds. $500 million will be used to construct Bitcoin mining infrastructure, and the other half billion will go toward buying even more Bitcoin, bringing the country's stash to about 2,000 Bitcoins. Emily, your initial reaction when you heard this announcement? Well, my initial reaction was this is either really smart or really dangerous, because what's interesting about this, in particular, the bond issuance, is that it's really based on the assumption that Bitcoin is going to keep going up. And not only is it going to keep going up, it's going to keep going up a lot. So, you know, if that happens, yeah, they're getting in on the action really early. If that doesn't happen, then it's pretty dangerous. So I don't know. It's it's going to be a really interesting experiment. Yeah, Blockstream is developing 10 10- year Bitcoin bonds, estimating 146% annual percentage yield based on the prediction that Bitcoin will be worth $1 million within the next five years. Uh, what could go wrong, right? Um, exactly. exactly. Lawrence, Sounds reasonable when, to me. When the announcement was made, Bitcoin didn't make much of a price no. uh, reaction. What, what's your analysis on that? Nobody cares. I, I, I mean, look, it, it, it's... <laughs> I, oh, cool. um, <laughs> no, I look the the it's like, OK, great. This is a few years out. Let's see what happens. Right. So you got to build all this infrastructure with the bonds. Right. That's the whole idea. Uh, you got to hope that Bukele stays in power. That's another idea. Um, you know, he's he is popular. But I mean, how much and how much can he sustain his his political uh, situation for 10 years? Uh, El Salvador has some interesting political history, to be sure. Um, it, you know, obviously things have changed since those those days from when we were kids, uh, definitely from when I was a kid. But um, it, it's still, you know, it's, it's a big bet. It's a big bet on infrastructure in El Salvador. Um, and it also, you would hope that besides mining, that electricity that's being used for mining or that the infrastructure that's being used to create all that mining infrastructure could also be used to do other things. And that that is, I mean, obviously the reason why a country would want to uh, get involved in this kind of debt um, and, and this kind of financing. It, that's a big bet too. It's not just about um, it's not just about Bitcoin. So I think the market is looking at this right now and they're like, look, we got other concerns right now. Um, you know, we're at the mm-hmm. end of the year. Let's see if there's enough demand for Bitcoin in the short term to get over uh, what's pretty much a sell-off. Right. Well, it's an ambitious, innovative project, a huge experiment in Bitcoin 
in society, in government. So really fascinating to see how that develops. I'll mention this tweet from Peter McCormick, a podcast host who's tweeting that, you know, Costa Rica, by contrast, wants to introduce a 13% VAT and 15% capital gains tax on Bitcoin, whereas uh, El Salvador is issuing $1 billion in Bitcoin bonds and building a city free of income and capital gains tax on Bitcoin. So it'd be interesting to see how these two different plays work out for these Central American countries. All right, let's take a look at our spotlight guest. The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. A bipartisan group of U.S. lawmakers introducing a bill to amend crypto-related provisions in the infrastructure bill signed into law last week. The Keep Innovation in America Act seeks to amend the definition of a broker and other tax provisions to prevent miners, developers, and recipients of transactions from being roped into heightened reporting requirements. Joining us now to discuss is one of the bill's advocates, Minnesota U.S. Representative Tom Emmer, who is also the leading Republican on the House FinTech Task Force. Welcome, Congressman. Thanks for joining us. So lawmakers attempted to make similar amendments in the original infrastructure bill. They failed. So what are the chances of getting this legislation through? Well, all cards are on the table. First off, Christine, Emily Lawrence, thanks for having me again. It's great to see you. Great to be with you. Look, the uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill is what you're talking about. Uh, it has become law. Uh, in it, it has uh, what was uh, it, to the community would be known as the Portman amended, uh, Amendment. Uh, this was a, a misguided amendment intended to uh, uh, scoop up tax revenue in the uh, crypto space. Uh, it's the good news. Bad news is it's law right now, Christine. Uh, the good news is it does not take effect until 2023. And if left unfixed, uh, this infrastructure bill and this specific language will have a devastating impact in the future of crypto innovation in America. And if you want, I can go through why. But uh, your question is more to the bill that we filed last week. Uh, everything is on the table. We're going to try and get this thing fixed before the end of the year, and if not, uh, in the next Congress for sure. So, Representative Emmer, uh, who supports this? And, I mean, who opposes it aside from, obviously, Brad Sherman? <laughs> well, there are uh, there are plenty of uh, uh, those opposed to it now, Lawrence. You know, when it came up in August during the debate over in the Senate on the, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, my understanding is this uh, specific language was uh, lobbied on uh, Senator Portman uh, by the Treasury Secretary, her office, by Janet Yellen's office. And the problem with the language, there are three major problems. It expands the definition of broker to include non-custodial entities like miners and software providers. It would require these brokers to collect know your customer information on their customers. And why is this important? Because miners and software providers don't have customers. The effect of the language would uh, have miners, software developers, and other non-custodial blockchain entities uh, trying to figure out how they get information necessary to comply with the law. Uh, they're not going to be able to. So uh, for some of us, it means that uh, these opportunities uh, will likely move overseas. Another problem with it, Lawrence, is it requires brokers to report on transactions between customers and non-customers. Uh, an example of this would be if I'm a customer of Coinbase and I give you crypto and you're not a customer of Coinbase, under the bipartisan infrastructure bill, this language, Coinbase would have to collect the know your customer information on you, Lawrence. Uh, the problem with that is it's just not feasible with the pseudo anonymity of this decentralized technology. I mean, that's the whole point of uh, blockchain uh, technology. Uh, and then lastly, it applies digital assets to what is known as a 6050i cash reporting requirement under the Internal Revenue Code. This, uh, this provision in the code requires businesses to report the identity of customers who use cash to pay for a product or service that is $10,000 or more. This provision obviously would deter businesses well, it does deter businesses from accepting cash for large transactions, and it pushes people to use debit or credit cards. The language in the bipartisan infrastructure bill that's now lie, law would apply digital assets to this reporting requirement. 
making it so that businesses would have to report the identity of people who use crypto to pay for large transactions. Again, because the technology is pseudo anonymous, it's uh, supposed to function like cash. This is a, uh, a major problem as it would essentially give the government the ability to connect Americans wallet address for their identity, Lawrence. Now there's a lot of people opposed to it. So in terms of in Congress itself, though, I mean, who, who are we seeing that's that's backing her um, and who, who's opposed to it? So we can kind of uh, I guess we, we can kind of put odds on this. Well, it's uh, and I'm sorry for the long explanation. I gave you all that because it started out probably with fewer uh, people in opposition. Uh, the Senate had to learn what it was, Lawrence. I think you uh, you have a lot of senators, as you saw the amendments, uh, you know, start up with a flurry before that uh, so-called biff came out of the Senate in the House. We have a bill that we filed last week with uh, ranking member McHenry and Tim Ryan of Ohio. It's right now got 10 uh, uh, signers, uh, including uh, six Republicans, four Democrats. But I could tell you, look at the blockchain caucus, which is, uh, you know, we, we've got uh, 30, 40 members so far. Uh, this is going to be something that just grows in the opposition. I think you're going to see that uh, if you're gaming it, it's mostly timing. I don't think it's going to be a matter of us getting enough people to support us with a fix. It's what is the fix and what's the timing? Can we get it done before the end of the year in an appropriations bill and a final uh, budget agreement? Or is it going to take next Congress, Lawrence? I do think we're going to be able to fix this, though. Uh, Congressman Emmer, so everything you're saying makes total sense in terms of why this would be disastrous for the U.S. crypto industry. But a few interesting things have happened as this bill has progressed. One, the market is just not reacting, right? If anything, the market has been going up, which I've found somewhat surprising. And the other is that some of these players that seem to be most affected by this seem a little bit blasé about it. We've had some like mining companies on the show who are in North America who seem to like just not be that concerned about it. So what, 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 what is that about? I mean, is, is there a chance, like, why is the market not reacting more strongly to what would something that seems to be this dramatic? Well, it's something that people, elected officials, should be uh, very concerned about. In the words of Lawrence that he used earlier, nobody cares. Uh, it really comes, well, I mean, if you think about it, uh, the reason the market's not reacting is because this is uh, a technology, the opportunities uh, that are created through uh, in this industry. Uh, we can either create a light touch regulatory uh, uh, structure that people understand and that people can actually work within, or it's going to leave. So I think the marketplace says, you know, it's it's ours to lose uh, and we need to do the work because it's going to happen with or without us. And then uh, as far as, uh, you know, the people that are impacted, those are the very people that are going to decide where this goes. Does it stay here in uh, the United mm -hmm. States of America? Or Congress, do we move it? Yes. Just, we have some news out that uh, Jerome Powell will be renominated or nominated again for a second term as the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Just a quick reaction to that. Well, I, it's actually uh, from a positive um, standpoint, it's at least consistency, right? Uh, there was some uh, push from the far left to weaponize, uh, and some of us would say further weaponize the uh, the Fed. Uh, in this case, at least uh, we know uh, what Jerome Powell is all about. We don't have to try and figure out someone new. That's the good side. Uh, on the, uh, I would say, more difficult side is he's uh, really uh, leaning in on creating a, uh, a central bank digital currency, which, as you uh, three know, I, I completely oppose. That should be not the government's function. We shouldn't be trying to emulate uh, the Communist Party of China. We should be trying to encourage people mm -hmm. in the private sector here to grow that. Well, uh, you know, Brainerd's El Salvador, be... and, and just clear. Okay, go ahead. I was just going to ask, uh, Lil Brainerd is going to be uh, nominated as vice chair. Is there, do you have any thoughts on that, uh, Republican Carlos? Again, Lawrence, it's uh, it's consistent, right? It's uh, we we at least know what we're we at least know what we're dealing with. I think it gives us an opportunity to pick up uh, where we have built to, as opposed to having to start at the ground again and build a new foundation with new people in these positions. So, from that standpoint, I think it's uh, it's reassuring. Uh, they just don't they aren't on all fours with the way some of us see the future. So I think uh, now we at least have the relationship. Let's see if we can build on it and improve it. 
And Congressman, just one final uh, question. You know, El Salvador made this huge announcement of a building a Bitcoin city. It'll have zero income tax, zero capital gains tax, zero property tax, zero payroll tax, and zero municipal tax. Is that inspiration for the United States? Uh, what was your reaction when you heard about this? Well, I, I loved your conversation, right? Because uh, all of this comes with risk. Uh, people who are looking to the future, people who have a vision of the future, uh, they they are not uh, stuck with the uh, challenges of today. They're going to try and overcome so them. As somebody, as somebody said to me with uh, with baseball one day, awful hard to play third base with both hands placed firmly around your throat, right? Uh, at least in El Salvador, they're going to play loose. They're going to uh, try to figure out how to move uh, forward, and it could create wonderful opportunities. Is there risk? Sure, there's always risk, but this is uh, forward thinking. I think our country, maybe not that far. Uh, then again, let's let the private sector tell us uh, where the uh, where the ceiling is, as opposed to government. I don't know. One. Miami is, is quite uh, doubling down on Bitcoin as well. So we'll see about Love that. that Congressman Emmer, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate you coming on and and sharing your insights with us. That was U.S. Representative of Minnesota, Tom Emmer. Coming up, checking in on Asia and a crypto markets update with investment firm, Arca. When we say we want to reimagine money, it turns out we're going to the heart of the matter. Imagination has always been a key part of what money is. Imagination in the form of cultural creativity is also something that the cryptocurrency community has in spades. And to the outsider, that can be a reason to dismiss it as frivolous, as something built on nothing. To dismiss it for these reasons, though, is to ignore that all money is imagined. Time now for the Daily Forecast, an update on what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Here's Mega Chatta of Forecast News. Welcome to the Daily Forecast, November 22nd, 2021. I'm Mega Chatta of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain. South Korea's Game Rating and Administration Committee has reiterated its ban on NFT games. We'll take a look at what that means for both developers and gamers and a whole lot more coming up. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. Let's kick off with some of the top stories out of Asia today. Bitcoin mining difficulty has come closest to the level it was at just before China's clamped down on the mining sector and the crypto crash that followed back in May. The difficulty level, which is a measure of the computing power required to mine Bitcoin, dropped four consecutive times immediately after China intensified its clampdown. But according to data from BTC.com, last week's adjustment saw an increase of almost 5%, the ninth increase in a row. However, a slight fall is expected for the next adjustment. Meanwhile, South Korea's Bitham exchange has crossed the finish line, with its compliance report to the latest crypto regulations being accepted by the country's Financial Intelligence Unit. All four of Korea's major crypto exchanges, Upbit, Bitham, Coinwan and Corbit, are now officially licensed, having fulfilled all criteria of the crypto law, which that means that they can operate cash to crypto services. You can find out more at focus.news. Staying in Korea, NFT games once again the talk of the space. The chair of the Game Rating and Administration Committee said once again that it cannot allow NFT games. However, he added that not all blockchain-based games are banned. Focus News' Danny Park has more on what that means. Both blockchain-based and play-to-earn NFT games are globally popular, with South Korean developers like WeMade seeing huge success. Its play-to-earn game Mirror 4 was at number 8 on the game's platform Steam's most played chart Monday afternoon Asia time. However, Korean game developers are not able to release their NFT games back home, as encouraging speculative behavior is banned. Speaking at a debate on NFTs and the metaverse, Kim Kyu-chul, Korea's Game Rating Committee chairman, explained that unless the law restricting speculation is changed, the committee will continue to ban NFT games that allow in-game earnings to be cashed out. Be that as it may, Kim said the committee will welcome blockchain-based games that steer clear of cashable NFTs. But he doubts any such games will be developed, as they don't bring in profit. 
One expert told Forecast News the current regulations stifle growth and should be loosened up. 일부는 좀 어, 수용하는 쪽으로 어, 그 법안을 좀 일부 개선을 하는 게 좋지 않겠느냐. 어, 거기에 이제 유예를 두는 그 샌드박스 규제라고 하죠. 그래서 뭐 2, 3년 정도 어, 문제점이 있을 때 그때 좀 더. 어, 강한 레벨의 뭐 규제를 한다든지 아니면은 Kim says behind Korea's strict policy in gaming stands a culture where children's education is number one, which makes video games the boss villain. For Forecast News, I'm Danny Park. Over in Laos, the government has issued new regulations for crypto miners and exchanges. The Southeast Asian nation says companies must be wholly Lao owned with a stable financial status. In addition, they must make a security deposit of 5 million US dollars with the Bank of Laos. Focus News' Timmy Shen has more. As reported by the Laotian Times, the country's Minister of Technology and Communications specified in addition that mining companies should use at least 10 megawatts of power under a six-year extendable contract with the national electricity provider. The new rules also offer perks for crypto miners, with the government saying it will exempt power transmission and import fees for mining operations. Laos' new rules for the industry come after the country authorized six firms to trade and mine cryptocurrencies back in September. That move ended a ban on crypto mining that had been imposed in 2018. According to World Bank data, Laos is one of the poorest countries in Southeast Asia with a per capita gross domestic product of just 2,630 US dollars in 2020. A report from US Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration shows that in practice, the Lao economy is highly dollarized, with the currency frequently being used for private transactions involving imported goods. For Forecast News, I'm Timmy Shan. And that's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm Mika Chada. Until next time. The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. All right, let's have a live look at Bitcoin. The Coindesk Bitcoin price XVX index is trading at $58,525. Bitcoin is now slightly down about six tenths of a percent over the past 24 hours. The Coindesk Ether price ETX index is trading at $4,264. ETH also taking a step back 1.4% for the day. The new DFX Coindesk DeFi index is at 564 points, though. DeFi is doing uh, pretty well in comparison, up about almost 2% over the past 24 hours. And joining us now to discuss the crypto markets is Jeff Dorman, Chief Investment Officer at ARCA, an investment firm with over $500 million in assets under management. Welcome, Jeff, to the show. So El Salvador just made a huge announcement, this Bitcoin city that they're going to build, though it doesn't seem to have much moved the price of Bitcoin at all. In fact, Bitcoin is now a bit negative. DeFi is going up. Yeah, I mean, El Salvador is clearly turning themselves into a powerhouse in Bitcoin. But, you know, we have to remember the absolute dollars involved in everything that El Salvador has done to date has been pretty meaningless relative to the size of Bitcoin. I mean, the Bitcoin ETF generated $1.3 billion of new demand in three days. Um, you know, a $500 million bond or anything to date that El Salvador has done uh, really isn't all that material uh, in, in the in the gr uh, grander scheme of how large Bitcoin is and how much money has to enter to really uh, have an impact on Bitcoin. Uh, Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about where in, um, inflation and just like the CPI is is, is playing in, in Bitcoin's price? Because there's definitely a lot of controversy about this. How big a part of the Bitcoin narrative is inflation and consumer prices going up? Sure. I mean, long term, I think Bitcoin is really just a, a call option, right? It, it's either worth basically nothing or it's probably worth a million dollars per coin. And everything in between is just a path function in terms of probabilities of getting to one of those two extremes. So to be worth zero, a lot would have to go wrong. I think pretty much nobody at this point, other than a, a few people still living 10 years ago, um, really believes that's the outcome. Um, so now we're just talking about what it takes to get Bitcoin to a $10 trillion asset or something in line with gold or something with the money supply. So inflation has been a large narrative um, you know, for a decade plus uh, with, for Bitcoin. Um, but each individual data point is not enough to you know, send Bitcoin 
to that number uh, overnight. I think what people are, are missing largely with the inflation number is this should have been expected and, and, and really was, right? And you can go back to 2008, 2009, when you come off of a depression and everything goes lower, when you strictly look at year over year comps, uh, the numbers are going to be huge. So the 2009, 2010 CPI prints were massive as well coming off a of depression. 2020, we basically had a quick depression because of the pandemic. Every year over year comp is going to be exploding. If you look more at two year over two year comps, it's been a more gradual increase, which is, which is truthfully exactly what the Federal Reserve was guiding towards, right? We've had one to 2% inflation for two decades. They want to push it to two to 3%. By definition, to get to two to 3%, you have to run hot for a few months. When you get into next year, you know, middle of 2022, the year over year comps are going to get much tougher. The CPI prints are going to start to move down. And then all of a sudden that narrative will, will switch again from uh, inflationary to disinflationary. So in my opinion, when you look at Bitcoin, anything that's inflationary is good for risk assets. You know, you want to be in an inflationary boom, that quadrant of the economic landscape where inflation is rising moderately and you have strong economic growth. You don't want to be in a disinflationary buzz where inflation is going down and economic growth is going down. Right now, we're in the sweet spot, right? GDP growth has been good. Corporate earnings have been good. And we're slowly uh, you know, seeing moderate inflation, which is good for equities. It's good for house prices. And it's good for Bitcoin and other digital assets. So in the meantime, Jeff, of course, uh, it, it, the zero or $1 million valuation is, uh, is uh, a while away, but we're seeing prices inch sl- slowly down. Is there a threat that we might see massive deleveraging, such as liquidation of, of long positions um, in the near term? I mean, it, it, is the market worried about that right now? I don't think you have seen the price moves in Bitcoin. I mean, when you have a show like you do and everyone's talking about Bitcoin day to day, sure, you can focus on every 5 or 10% move. But Bitcoin is now flat since May 1st, which means all of the gains right. for Bitcoin this year came in the first I, four I, months. By, I'm by just contrast, talking about, just, I'm just, now I'm just talking about what, how the market is currently positioned with, with what's, what's out there um, in terms of how much, how much leverage there is currently in the market let's say very short term, are, are we going to see some sort of, do you expect or do other people expect some of these long positions that are currently in place for the short term to be liquidated? I mean, you see, you see that periodically, right? But each one of, you know, every time you see one of these fast moves down, um, you know, like we saw in the middle of November and we saw a few days ago, you do see liquidations, right? We saw about a billion dollars of liquidations over the last 72 hours uh, with the bulk of those coming from Bitcoin. Um, that certainly shows uh, offsides positioning. But every time we get one of those liquidation events, the market resets. Perpetual swap funding rates go back to close to zero. Uh, the open interest in future starts to go down. The skew in the options market starts to reset. Um, the market really isn't nearly as levered as it was back in, say, the, the middle of May peak before we had you know, almost $10 billion of liquidations and had a 40% peak to trough decline. You know, a little bit of leverage here and there makes sense, right? First of all, the Bitcoin ETF that just got uh, uh, approved is a futures-based ETF, which means by definition, you're using leverage when you purchase that. So right there, that causes a little bit of open interest to rise across the CME, which then uh, spills down into other venues like Binance and Deribit and everywhere else. Um, when that happens, uh, it, it puts a, a, a high demand on cash because you need cash collateral to trade in the futures market. So that puts lending rates going higher. That lending rates going higher spills into the DeFi market. So you really do have this trickle-down effect just causing by one thing uh, in, in terms of the Bitcoin ETF. Um, and then if you get some of that retail momentum piling on, on top of that, then that's when you see the leverage explode on sustainable levels. But we're not there yet, right? The basis is at 10%. It was at 40% back in May. You know, Funding rates are 0.1%. They were at 0.1% back in May. So we're nowhere close to a right. level of... Of, of, of real uh, uh, concern uh, in terms of leveraged traders. Jeff, uh, we got to wrap it there, but just quickly, because uh, ARCA has been raising a lot of money, a lot of assets under management now, what is your outlook for next year and what are you focused on in the crypto markets? Sure. Um, yeah, we're really focused on other areas of the market besides Bitcoin. I mean, we have, we, we've been uh, a strong advocates and, and, and consistent advocates that this is no longer an asset class. This is now a technology that underpins all asset classes, which means that you're going to have digital assets that represent currencies, that represent commodities, that represent fixed income and equities, uh, and eventually you know, real assets like, like real estate. 
what that means is you can't ever say anymore digital assets are up or down because that would make no more sense than saying ETFs are up or down, right? The individual things inside the ETF is what matters. The same thing is now true of digital assets. So, you know, for instance, what I was saying earlier is, um, you know, over the last six months since, since May 1st, um, you know, Bitcoin is basically flat. Over that same time period, DeFi is down 30 to 50%, while layer one protocols are up 300 to 400%, and gaming and NFTs are up, you know, 500 to 1,000%. That's what we're going to continue to see in 2022 and beyond. We're going to see specialization uh, and unique price reactions based on sector, based on theme, based on token type that really have nothing to do with what you might see in an index that's 80% Bitcoin or Ethereum. So we're looking forward to investing in different pockets of growth from gaming to NFTs to Web3 to structured products where we say, where, 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 where we think digital assets and ultimately blockchain, blockchain based technology is going to fuel the growth of these companies and projects. Yep. Jeff, I often track your subsector growth charts. So thank you for <laughs> those insights. Uh, that was ARCA CIO Jeff Dorman. Time now to check in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day, who is also the editor of Coindesk, the State of Crypto Newsletter. Hello there, Nick. So we have some breaking news. Fed Chair Jerome Powell will be nominated for a second term as head of the Federal Reserve by President Joe Biden. What do we know? Good morning. Yes, Biden announced this morning that he will renominate Federal Reserve Chair Powell to a second term. Lael Brainard, who is currently at the Boston Fed, will be nominated to a to the term of vice chair. Uh, she was kind of the other front runner for the chair position, uh, but Powell, uh, you know, has bipartisan support, which may be one of the reasons why he is getting the nod. Um, in a statement, Biden did point to Powell's actions during the pandemic as one of the reasons for renominating him, saying, quote, I'm confident that Chair Powell and Dr. Brainard's focus on keeping inflation low, prices stable, and delivering full employment will make our economy stronger. And so far, markets seem to be doing fairly well. Uh, the dollar index has climbed to its highest point since September 2020, according to Bloomberg, and Dow futures are up 150 points, according to CNBC. All right. Yet yeah, Bitcoin is slightly down and as uh, other parts of the crypto mix results. Thank you, Nick, for the the update. We got to end it there. That was Coindesk Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation, Nick Day. Time now to check in with Crypto Twitter for our tweet of the day. Now, when all the Bitcoin City Kool-Aid has been drunk, some sobering reflection from Jameson Lopp, Bitcoin advocate and co-founder of Casa Hoddle, tweeting, there are plenty of ways the El Salvador Bitcoin project could fail, most of which are outside of our control. But what effective way we can mitigate some risks to citizens is to teach them to use Bitcoin directly and not just through a government-run Bitcoin bank. All right, that's it for First Mover. Thank you, Emily Parker and Lawrence Lewton. I'm your host, Christine Lee. I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with All About Bitcoin. Coming up at noon are the friendly folks from The Hash. You're watching Coindesk TV.